This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We are the paradoxical eight. Bipedal, naked, large-brained, long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves, aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Well, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Anne, and to the organizers for inviting me to participate in the symposium today, and also to all of you for coming back after the break. Um, so it's nice to see everyone again. So I'm really happy to have the opportunity to tell you about some of our recent work on mapping archaic hominin DNA in the genomes of modern humans. And actually, my talk, um, you'll see, is going to be pretty similar to our first speaker, Sri Ram. Um, and in fact, when he was talking, I was thinking to myself um, how nice it was, actually, that um, some of the things he was saying overlapped with what I was going to talk about. Because we were working on these projects completely independently. Um, we developed very different statistical methods to answer the same questions, and yet, by and large, we came to many of the same conclusions. So I think it engenders confidence in the things that we're presenting today. And my graduate student, Benjamin Verneau, and I first became interested in this question of archaic admixture a few years ago. And I think this is actually one of the most fascinating topics in all of genetics and genomics these days, is all of the things that we've learned from ancient DNA sequencing. And one of the more contentious questions, I think, in human evolution has been, whether or not modern humans um, mated or hybridized with archaic humans, like Neanderthals and Denisovans. And for many decades, this was just sort of an acrimonious debate, and that was largely because the data didn't exist to answer the question. But with technologies developed by Svante Pabo and some of the other speakers we've heard from this morning, Matthias and Kai, um, in the not too uh, many years ago, we we're able to get high quality genome sequences from the Neanderthal and Denisovan genomes. And this provided sort of unambiguous evidence that modern humans and these archaic humans did in fact hybridize and exchange genes. And as um, Matthias talked about this morning though, studying ancient DNA from fossils still remains really challenging because you have to find an appropriate specimen first of all, um, and you have to hope that the DNA has been preserved over um, hundreds of thousands of years. So my student and I um, thought, well, if there was gene flow between modern humans and archaic humans, maybe we could excavate ancient DNA, not directly from fossils, but indirectly from the genomes of modern humans. And to give you a, a sort of a, a little bit of an intuition of how this works, um, I'd like to argue that a little bit of archaic introgression goes a long way. And so in this schematic, I'm showing you a picture of um, 10 or so individuals. These aren't random individuals. These are my colleagues in the Department of Genome Sciences. 
and this is what happens when you put your picture on the internet. Um, <laughs> so, so each line here, um, let's it, imagine represents a stretch of, of each person's genome. And from previous work, we knew that all non-Africans had about 2% of their DNA inherited from Neanderthal ancestors. And that's what's represented by these yellow uh, chunks of sequence. And so what we w wanted to do was develop a method where we could walk along an individual's genome and pull out the parts that were inherited from Neanderthal ancestors. And the key here is that the 2% of my genome that was inherited from Neanderthals might be a little bit different than the, your 2%. So that when we aggregate the data across many individuals, we can actually recover a substantial amount of the Neanderthal genome. And actually, what I find most compelling about this approach is that as opposed to sequencing ancient DNA from a single fossil, by recovering these all surviving archaic lineages, we're potentially um, getting data that was, uh, or getting sequences that were inherited from multiple archaic ancestors. So we're getting population level data, and that will allow us to make inferences that are difficult or impossible to do if you just have genetic data from a single individual. So I'm not gonna talk a lot about the details of how we scan along an individual's genome um, and look for our archaic sequence, but I did want to give you a little bit of intuition. So what are the characteristics of introgressed archaic sequence that we look at? Well, what I'm showing you here is a simple schematic um, showing that uh, Europeans diverged from Africans about 80,000 years ago or so. And what we want to find, or if we look at lineages superimposed on this tree, we can see that what we're actually interested in finding are cases like this. So sequences that are found in non-Africans that were inherited from a Neanderthal ancestor. So what are the features that we expect uh, for these types of sequences? Well, the first is that in contrast to two modern human sequences that have a much more recent uh, common ancestor, mutation will have had a long time to act and accumulate. We want to find these sequences. So mutation will have had a longer time to act and accumulate on this lineage compared to two modern human lineages. But the other key feature is that Admixture happened relatively recently, so in the last 60 to 80,000 years or so. And therefore, the Neanderthal haplotypes will still persist over sizable genomic regions. So it's this combination of highly divergent sequences that stretch over large genomic distances that allow us to accurately and robustly predict what are archaic sequences versus what are modern human sequences. And actually, the approach we're using um, is a modification of a statistic called S-star that was developed by Jeff Wall. Um, and one of the nice things about this approach is it doesn't explicitly use the Neanderthal or the Nisavan genome when making the initial inference. And the really powerful thing about that is we can potentially discover archaic lineages from groups that we don't even know about yet. Um, and actually, that's a, a major part of what we're looking at now um, but that will have to be a story for a different day. So what I'm going to tell you about, though, is applying this method to 1,500 geographically diverse individuals. So whole genome sequences from about 1,500 people um, all throughout the world. These are largely sequences from the Thousand Genomes Project. So this is a publicly available data set. But to supplement this, we also sequenced, uh, in collaboration with Svante Pablo's group, 35 individuals from Melanesia. And the idea here was that we knew from previous work that these individuals should have substantial amounts of both Neanderthal and Denisovan sequence. And if we look at um, the amount of archaic ancestry that we find per individual, that's what I'm showing on this slide. So the, this shows the distribution of the amount of archaic sequence per individual in Melanesians, East Asians, South Asians and Europeans. And you can see that Melanesians have, on average, much more archaic sequence per individual compared to some of the other non-African groups. And the reason is, as I just mentioned, um, they have substantial amounts of both Neanderthal and Denisovan sequence. And so each row here is an individual, and the bar plot plots correspond to how much Neanderthal versus Denisovan sequence each individual has.
And if you look closely, there's a small amount of sequence that we label as ambiguous. This is sequence that we are confident is archaic in origin, but we can't distinguish, robustly at least, whether or not it's Neanderthal or Denisovan. Okay? So on average, um, Europeans have about 50 to 55 megabases of archaic sequence per individual, and this is largely Neanderthal in origin. South Asians have a little bit more, East Asians have a little bit more, uh, and Melanesians have about, on average, 100 megabases of archaic sequence per individual. So that's 100 million base pairs. So that's great. We can identify archaic sequence, but I think the really interesting thing is the things that we can potentially learn from it. So what are the types of questions that surviving archaic lineages allow us to ask? So I'm going to tell you about three things that we've been interested in. So the first is, was hybridization between archaic humans and modern humans deleterious? That is, were there bad consequences? Conversely, was hybridization beneficial? Or were there some good consequences of hybridization? And finally, what demographic model is consistent with patterns of introgressed archaic sequences? So let's start with the first question. Were there deleterious consequences to hybridization? And one of the most striking things that we found when first looking at patterns of Neanderthal sequence across the genome is that it's very heterogeneously distributed. So I'm showing you sequence, sequences from chromosome 7, 8, and 9. So the blue ticks represent places where we find Neanderthal sequence in European individuals. The red lines indicate places where we find Neanderthal sequence in East Asian individuals. And the gray lines uh, represent parts of the genome that are too repetitive for us to study and be confident in the predictions from. And so if you squint long enough at this figure, you can see that there, it doesn't appear, and Sriram mentioned this earlier, that patterns of surviving sequence are sort of randomly distributed across the chromosomes. But you find these regions that have been called deserts or depletions of archaic ancestry that extend over really large genomic regions. And this is consistent with there being deleterious consequences to having Neanderthal sequence in these regions. And in fact, when we do extensive simulations and try to model this process, we see that there is an excess in the observed data of these depletions or archaic deserts compared to simulated data under neutral models of evolution. So what does that mean? It just means basically that under neutral evolution, so where there's no fitness consequences to the Neanderthal sequence, we really wouldn't expect to see deserts this large in the real data. So I think this is pretty compelling evidence that there was deleterious fitness consequences to hybridization. And what's really kind of fascinating to me is that if you also superimpose Denisovan sequences on top of this data, you find that there's a significant overlap between Neanderthal deserts and Denisovan deserts. So the same places in the human genome that are depleted of Neanderthal sequences are also depleted of Denisovan sequences. And again, this is very consistent with the idea that these regions maybe are harboring genetic changes that are very important to modern human phenotypes. So for example, the largest region, or the largest depletion, is on chromosome seven. It's about a 15 megabase um, desert. So there's lots of genes. One of the challenges in interpreting these regions is that in a 15 megabase sequence, there's about 100 genes or so. So you don't actually know which one is driving the signal that you're interested in. But one thing that caught our eye, and uh, as Sri Ram mentioned this morning, is right in the middle of this largest desert is a gene called FOXP2. And FOXP2 has previously been associated with um, being important in speech and language. And in fact, uh, work from Svante's group has shown that there's human-specific mutations in regulatory regions of FOXP2. So again, I want to be careful here, and we haven't proven that FOXP2 is driving this depletion of Neanderthal sequence in this region, but it's really interesting, and, um, and I think these deserts of archaic ancestry can help us pinpoint places in the human genome that might be important in modern human evolution. So the search space is much narrower now 
compared to when we first did these studies. Another question that we were interested in asking is, well, so it seems like there were some deleterious consequences to hybridization. Was there also evidence that maybe some of the sequences we picked up from Neanderthals or Denisovans, was that beneficial? And probably the simplest way to look at this question is to look at the frequency of Neanderthal or Denisovan sequences in modern populations. And that's what I'm showing you here. So each dot represents a uh, frequency of either a Neanderthal or a Denisovan haplotype in East Asians, Europeans, Melanesians, and South Asians. And you can see that for the most part, the vast majority of archaic sequence that persists in modern human populations is pretty rare, so usually less than 10% frequency. But there's a number of regions that have risen to high frequency, so 60% in some cases, and in some cases uh, even a little bit higher. And we've done extensive modeling, um, again, to try to determine how likely it is to see these high-frequency haplotypes in the absence of selection. And it turns out that above 50% you know, or so, it's actually really unusual for a haplotype to randomly drift up to such high frequencies. So there's about 100 or so, um, I think, really high-confident targets of adaptive introgression. And you might wonder, so what, were, what phenotypes were influenced by adaptive introgression? And so we knew previously that a version of a gene called EPAS1 in certain Tibetan populations was inherited from Denisovans, and it's this gene that allows them to live at high altitude. So there was already some pretty good a priori evidence that admixture with archaic humans was beneficial uh, for some genes. And when we look carefully at these 100 high-frequency archaic haplotypes, we see that they are largely comprised of genes that can be categorized into two classes. One, the immune system. So many genes that influence immune phenotypes, and in particular, innate immunity. So the part of our immune system that deals with viruses and bacteria. So that seems to be a, a very um, enriched target or substrate of adaptive introgression. And I think you could have predicted this a priori. So the, it's known that the immune system is often a target of selection. But the other category of genes that actually I would have never predicted a priori turns out to be a number of genes that have important functions in skin biology. Um, so, for example, one of these genes, as, as Sri Ram mentioned, is BNC2. Uh, it's a gene called basonuclein 2 that has recently been shown to influence skin pigmentation levels in Europeans. And um, so it's at very high frequency. Um, each row here, again, is an individual, and columns are variant sites. And these individuals carry the Neanderthal haplotype. And you can see that it's a very high-frequency haplotype in Europeans, not found in East Asians. And finally, and real quickly, I'm just going to um, give you a brief synopsis on the things we can learn about demographic models. And whenever I think of demographic models, um, this image from National Geographic comes to mind. <laughs> um, I think it's sort of a fascinating picture, actually. Um, my kids really like this, too, because they say I look like him. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's uh, a different story. <laughs> um, and so what are the things that we can try to learn? Well, we want to know things like when, when did hybridization happen? How many times did it happen? Did different populations have the same or different admixture histories? And I have a postdoc, Joshua Schraber, um, who developed a really clever method of trying to infer whether two populations had the same admixture history or different admixture histories. And so when we apply this method um, to pairs of populations that we analyzed, um, the details here aren't important, but we can infer sort of this general picture of, so this is Europeans, East Asians, Melanesians, Africans, Neanderthals, and Denisovans. And the main point I want to impress upon you is that maybe even compared to as recently as a few years ago, it seems like the admixture history between modern and archaic humans is much more complex. And in fact, the data is consistent with multiple pulses of admixture um, between Neanderthals and modern humans. 
and at least one pulse of admixture with the Nisibans. So in conclusion, um, I've shown you that substantial amounts of the Neanderthal and Denisovan genome remain scattered in the DNA of modern humans, that there were fitness consequences to hybridization, both good and bad, and that the history of contact was much more complex than previously thought. And I would like to thank uh, people in my lab. Um, so this guy right here in the middle is Benjamin Verneau. He was a graduate student who is now a postdoc with Svante Pabo, but he, um, by and large, did most of the work that I talked about today. So with that, I will thank you uh, and, I guess, answer questions after everyone's done.